Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first session in the second series of American English Live Teacher Development. My name is Moderator Kate, and I'll be with you behind the scenes today, along with my colleagues, Moderator Lauren and Heather. Today, our host, John Mark King, will be talking with English language specialist Stephanie Owens about dynamic ways to check answers and share responses in the English as a foreign language classroom. So let's go ahead and get started by welcoming our host, John Mark King. Welcome, John Mark. Hi, Kate. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fantastic. It's a beautiful day here in Washington, as you know, because you're also here. <laughs> and, um, I'm really excited about today's session. How about you? I'm very excited as well. It should be another good one. Yeah? yeah. Well, um, shall we get started then? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's get started. Because I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody, to American English Live Teacher Development Series number two. We're so glad to have you here today as we begin our second series of these events with an excellent presentation by Stephanie Owens, who I'll tell you about in just a moment. We want to extend a very, very warm welcome to those of you who are watching us out there for the very first time, we're very happy that you're here. We hope that you come back. And also, if you are visiting with us again, we are very happy that you're back. It's wonderful to have you here. We hope that you get a lot out of our conversation in the next hour or so. My name is John Mark King, and I work right here in Washington, D.C. at the Office of English Language Programs. And I'm part of the American English social media team. And I could not be happier to be your facilitator and your host today for the first session of our second series. Take a look at this photo. It is an American English live viewing group in Tunisia. I wanna send a very special thanks to Hazel Cipolle at the US Embassy in Tunis for sharing this amazing photo of American English Live participants at the American Spaces Center in Tunis. Don't they look like they're having fun? They played a game after our May 28th session to earn prizes. And so we hope that you're all having as much fun as they did while watching our sessions. We absolutely love to see teachers learning and sharing ideas as they view the American English Live series. So please, if you can, share your viewing group photos by emailing them to the address on your screen, American English Webinars at elprograms.org. You send it to us, you might see it in the next session, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. So let's look at the exciting lineup that we have for series number two over the next six sessions, starting with this one today. Our presentations for the series are on topics of classroom management, using authentic materials in the classroom, and teaching with technology. We are super excited for all that we're going to learn. What are you most excited to learn more about? Share it in the comments section below because we want to hear it. All right, so what's going to happen here? What can you expect? Well, each session, like today's, is about 60 minutes long, and we base the theme on another theme uh, in the Teacher's Corner section of our website. This month, we're discussing classroom management, and you can see some links that the moderators are sharing with you right now in the comments related to that theme. We hope you'll find those resources useful and you can take them right away into the classroom. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will interrupt the presenter and ask sometimes interesting questions and I'll make comments as well. But we really hope to hear from you the most, our audience, so that we can make sure that we address all your thoughts, all your challenges and hear your incredible ideas like we always do. So please write your comments and questions below the video right here and make sure to include your name and the country where you live so we can mention you when we share your ideas live. All right, you probably know this already. I'm going to tell you anyway. Today you have the opportunity to receive a digital badge from our team here at American English for Educators. What is a digital badge? I'm glad I asked. It's kind of like an electronic certificate except instead of a paper one, it's in your email. That's really all you need to know. And it's also fabulous. At the end of the session, you'll be given a link to complete a short quiz to receive this badge. 
You have to answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly and also respond to a short answer question. Be careful because you can only enter your information once. So read each question very, very carefully. And also please take your time. After that, you'll get your badge by email in about one week. So today's event, finally, dynamic ways to check answers and share responses in the EFL classroom. With many language learning activities, we all know it's important for teachers to confirm that students have correct or appropriate answers, right? And for them to share their ideas and thought processes with their classmates. However, we all know checking answers to a 10 question exercise can often take up the majority of the class period. And that leaves little time for more communicative activities that we know are very important. So today's session reviews ways that you can check answers and share responses in a variety of ways that keep students focused and engaged in their learning. And so it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Stephanie Owens. Stephanie began her career as a Fulbright English teaching assistant in Temuco, Chile, and has since taught and learned in Turkey, India, and the United States. Her professional interests include metacognition, student motivation, and teacher training and development. Originally from Connecticut, Stephanie holds a CELTA and a master's degree in TESOL from Adelphi University. In her free time, she likes playing cooperative board games, going to stand-up comedy shows, and reading. Stephanie, welcome to the program. How are you? Hello, uh, I'm doing well, thank you. And uh, thank you for the introduction, John, Mark, and Kate. And for everyone joining us, welcome to AE Live. And um, thanks to all of you joining us from around the world and to those who participated in the pre-webinar discussion on the Ning and the AE Live Facebook page. So I'm really excited to talk to you today about this topic. It's a big part of my drive to create a communicative classroom community and one where students listen to each other and have the opportunity to reflect on their learning. So let's talk about the presentation outline so you know what to expect. First, we'll just define some terms so we're all on the same page, but don't worry, there are only three of them. Then I'll give some background information about the challenges with checking answers and sharing responses and contrast those with what we're really trying to achieve when we spend time reviewing answers. And the last two sections are what I think you're all here for. I'll give you practical suggestions um, and techniques you can use for checking answers and sharing responses in your classroom. There are a total of 10 suggested activities that you could use as early as tomorrow. So first, let's review some vocab. The first term um, is IRF. And even if you've never used this, I'm sure you've experienced this interaction either as a student or as a teacher. So IRF stands for initiate. Usually the teacher asks a question. Response, this comes from the student and tends to be a very short reply. And feedback, usually an evaluative statement from the teacher like good, yes, correct. Um, or perhaps it's a response to what the student said. Oh, interesting, mm-hmm, I see. Um, so to illustrate, John Mark, will you be the student in purple and I will read the teacher's part in blue? Absolutely. Uh, great, thank you. So who has the answer for number five? John Mark? Uh, the answer is C. Yes. So as you can see, uh, this is probably one of the most traditional classroom patterns today. Uh, the teacher asks a question, calls on a student, and then tells them if they were right or not. And so if you'd like an illustration to help this stick, I often picture this as a game of ping pong. So almost every time it's the teacher serving, um, the student may or may not hit the ball back. Um, they might try really hard or they might just look over their shoulder as the ball goes past them and shrug um, or they, they do hit it back, but it doesn't hit the table on the other side. And what's really important here is that there are really only two people interacting. So no matter how 
large or small the class is, it's the teacher and one other per one other student talking or playing in this um, interaction. Well, so if we're talking about um, ping pong, this means only one person gets to play. Everybody exactly. wants to play, right? Of Just course. Like everybody needs to practice their English. Yes. So we'll talk more about this interaction model in a few minutes. And for now, we'll move on to our second term. So uh, the second term is checking answers. And for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to limit the definition of checking answers. So for us today, this refers to reviewing answers to questions or exercises that have a correct or incorrect response. In particular, I mean multiple choice, fill in the blank, true or false questions, um, and even some questions that have a short answer, but there's only one correct one. So maybe a, an answer to like a reading comprehension question. Um, so our fir my first question for our audience is, how much time do you spend checking answers in your English class? Um, our discussion participants on Ning and Facebook had a variety of responses. Jose Luis said about 50% of class. Um, Yasmin and Zainib said about 10 to 15 minutes. And other participants like Mohammed pointed out that it really depends on the size of the class and it could take a lot longer with a large class. Um, well, John Mark, in your yeah. Yeah, well, this is really interesting. I would say in my experience, it depends maybe if it's a 45 minute lesson or a 50 minute lesson at the most like maybe 10 minutes because it's important to do right but if you only have 50 minutes 10 minutes of it is checking answers that doesn't leave a whole lot of time and sometimes you know it's when the students are with me when they get almost all of their english practice so it's a challenge and i'm curious to see what our, uh, our participants who are viewing have to say about this as well um, Sa Ba says about five minutes. Um, Monica Flores Rojas says about 15 minutes. Now, if her lessons are like ours, less than an hour, mm -hmm. that's a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, we're also getting, just like I said, it depends on the activities. So I think we can all agree that it takes up a certain amount of time, sometimes a lot, sometimes not. It's worth addressing, I think. Exactly. All right, great. So we'll go back to that and ways to do it, ways to check answers in a fun and efficient way. Um, and we'll move on for our third term and the, the last one. Um, so this one is sharing responses. So I'd like to contrast this with checking answers. And so I'm using sharing responses to mean when students share their replies to open-ended questions, discussion questions, or maybe they summarize group work. Um, and so the response here might require a follow-up question or additional comments. So um, John Mark, um, if you practice with me again, I will promote you to teacher and you can read the blue bubbles. Does this I'll mean an increase student. in salary? Um, we'll see. All let's, right. Let's well, see happy, how you do. happy to uh, happy to be a teacher. So then, what do I do? I do the I start it and I be the blue, you be the purple. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Stephanie, what did you do over the weekend? I went shopping. Oh, where did you go shopping? Um, and so we could keep talking or um, just kind of stop there. But often we see these types of questions at the beginning of class when we want to warm up or just chat with our students. But we also want our students to share responses after they've completed a task with a partner or in a group, like answering discussion questions about a unit theme or responding to a reading text. Okay, so I can see here the difference between checking answers and sharing responses, right? With checking answers, we're talking about a quiz or homework responses can be more open-ended. How is that related to IRF? So both of my examples here show the teacher leading and using IRF to review the work. Um, and so there, in these examples, we use IRF, but I think if we move away from that, we can make the classroom more communicative and more participatory. So thank you for that question. We're gonna talk about some drawbacks to using IRF every time. So um, 
both for you, John Mark, as well as for our audience, what are some potential drawback of always using this IRF teacher to student back to teacher type of format when you're checking answers? Hmm, so you want to know my opinion? Yeah. Um, a drawback to IRF that I can see right away is, I mean, we've talked about it here on this series a lot, the importance of student talk time. It, the way that it's described in your definition, it's less student talk time. And that's a big drawback. Yes, that is a big one. Um, let's see, we're still waiting on some from our audience. I can also say that it's not very authentic. It doesn't, it's not the kind of interaction that you have outside of the classroom. Exactly. That's like if I went up to you on the street and said, oh, can you give me directions to the mall? And you did. And I said, oh, that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, that'd mm -hmm. be a very strange interaction with you. Or it'd be like coming up to a crowd of people on the sidewalk and saying, who knows how to get to the mall? And one person raises their hand and you say, good, well done. But from our audience, so Ilkay Ozdemir says too much teacher talk time. I think the teacher doesn't necessarily need to practice English as much as the students. Uh, Yusuf Khan says it's monotonous. Yes. I think I would agree with that. Definitely, um, Yusuf. <laughs> Monica Flores Rojas says the students might get demotivated because the same model's being used over and over again. Mm. Um, and Jose Manuel Villafuerte says we become predictable. Uh, these are all really great points. So I think we've covered the majority that I've listed. Let's kind of check our answers. Um, so the first one, we definitely said the teacher's the one doing all the talking, um, as well as the teacher's the only one with the right answers. So the teacher has all of the authority, which means when we later want students to listen to each other or trust each other's responses, they might not, and they'll just wait until we give the answer. Um, mm -hmm. Makes a tougher job for us. Um, as many participants said, students can just stop paying potential paying attention because they're bored. Um, one that came up at this morning was if students answer incorrectly, it might be embarrassing for them in front of the entire class, especially if it's a very large class. Um, this one really stands out to me that weaker students can get lost because usually we want to check answers very quickly. So, you know, one is A, two is B, three is D. And if a student had all of those incorrect, they're erasing and trying to write in the right answer and, and they just get very lost. And so that doesn't help them. Um, and one kind of upsetting one, this happened to me, is it can become a teacher, a round of, uh, but teacher, what about this? And when you have students asking you maybe very advanced grammar questions or kind of questions that really take the entire class off track. So, um, Oh, so these are just some of the drawbacks. Um, so despite all of these potential pitfalls, checking answers and sharing responses is something that we as teachers really want to do. Um, it's almost a built-in reflex or kind of unspoken expectation. Um, for instance, in, in my life, I can't think of a movie or a TV show that shows a teacher doing anything else besides standing at the front of the room and calling on students one by one by one. So um, given this, we shouldn't throw away all of our attempts at checking. So what do we want to do when we devote our very precious class time to this? Let's see what we're trying to achieve. So we want students to know the correct answers and how to get there. We want students with the wrong answers to know how to improve for later. We want to give students an opportunity to share their thought process with, with each other as well as to share their opinions and experiences with each other. And we also want an audience for student work or student ideas, someone to listen besides just the teacher. Um, and so to sum this up, I would say, if you recall the previous picture of the student like this, very bored, we want to go from a classroom of bored, unengaged student to this picture of the student you see here, who's actually the same girl, if you can recognize her, um, just bursting with ideas uh, and excited to share them. Uh, and one other benefit, and this is a bit counterintuitive, but um, sometimes when we give up more of this control and give more responsibility to the students, 
it gives the teacher even more control or power in the classroom. Well, it is true, isn't it, that our goal is to help them to become independent learners. And if we continue to present a model for learning that supports the, the teacher has all the information perspective, that doesn't help them become independent learners, does it? Exactly. And that's a great point. So now that we know what we're trying to achieve, let's talk about some ways we can get there. So in the next section, I will introduce five ways to check answers. And just to remind you all, when we say check answers for this presentation, we're talking about correct or incorrect, multiple choice, true, false, things that are usually easy to review kind of quickly. So let's take a look at the first technique. This one is called student as teacher. So you select a student to lead the review. And this can be any student because you're going to give them the answer key. So it doesn't have to be your strongest student or the student who finished first, um, but any, any student who you would like to give a leadership role to. So that student has the answer key and then they call on their peers and lead the class. Or you can also divide the class into groups and have multiple student teachers. And this really works the best when the student teacher can help elicit why the answers are correct or incorrect. So we see um, in our little picture, you know, questions like, so why do you think B is the best answer? Why didn't you choose D? What key words helped you pick the correct answer? Um, so this is still an IRF model, but it gives some other, one or more students the chance to talk all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it also gives uh, the students the, the power, which is in powers in the holding the information, holding the knowledge or the answers, right? Exactly. It's a model for what they actually are. They are actually do hold the power. They do hold all of the knowledge. Yes. And let's see if there are any other benefits to this one. Um, so yeah, there's leadership, students get the most practice. Um, this is very adaptable for a large class because you can do this in groups. It's also a good way to give early finishers something to do. So the, the students we always have who finish in two minutes when we've allotted 10 and they say done teacher, we can put them mm -hmm. in charge of helping their classmates. Um, and then the teacher can kind of walk around and listen to these discussions and really listen on this, listen to the students' explanations and their thought processes. Hmm. Well, we're getting some feedback. So Claudia Tavares agrees with us that we should all be concerned about making our students independent because, I mean, most of the time, if they're going to be successful, their learning is going to be outside of the classroom, isn't it? Yeah, so and that's a great point. That kind of uh, learning in the classroom. Uh, we have a question, though. It's a good question from Ya Reza HF. Um, how about our less courageous learners? How can you help them to take on the teacher, uh, the student as teacher role? Well, I think by giving them the answer key, that helps a little bit. Um, you can also have them lead smaller groups instead of standing in front of the whole class. And something else that helps is we mentioned how important it is to ask those types of questions. So that's something you can model, which you probably do in class when you as the teacher check answers. Um, you can also have visual aids like a poster up on the wall that students can refer to with some of those. So how did you know? What made you choose? Why didn't you choose this answer? And so with that practice and maybe small, going from smaller groups to bigger groups, that can help them out. Yeah, you could also um, make a student as teacher pair, put two together to be the student as teacher so that they can you know, rely on each other a little bit. Exactly. All right, so let's move on to the second activity. This one's called co Collect and Correct. Um, so students turn in their homework, and then this part's very important. They begin some type of routine activity. Usually it's effective if it's a solo work. So maybe they do a free write and just write quietly for 10 minutes. Maybe they are reading silently for 10 minutes or doing something else where that doesn't require a lot of teacher monitoring. So then while students are working, the teacher corrects the homework. 
And again, since this is checking answers, things that are very easy to correct, like fill, uh, fill in the blank if it's very short, multiple choice, or true or false. And then as the teacher, you have the option to hand it back or keep it. And um, so let's talk about some benefits for this one. And um, so the teacher can see who needs extra help or who needs more challenging material if someone was getting everything correct on the first go. Um, the teacher can decide if most of the students were having trouble with this assignment. The teacher can do a more in-depth review. And the teacher can also learn more about the pattern, about their students based on patterns of mistakes that they see. Um, and it doesn't take up too much class time for students at least. Um, and for those of you in large classes, one thing that can work for you is maybe you decide that in a group, only one, one paper gets turned in from the group, or students know that on a certain day of the week, that's when they turn in their papers. Um, so again, and we're talking about things that are quick to correct, like true and false. You know what I like too, this will be really important if, if, for example, an activity that you're doing later depends on how you think they did on a particular assignment as a teacher. Because I mean, normally the, the best time to do this is when you're at home or when you're out of class. But if you need to know how they did on a certain homework assignment in order to help you to modify a future activity for that lesson, Click and Click is a fantastic um, approach for that. Yeah, that's a great point. You can know if you, you have the chance to move on more quickly or do something a little more demanding with your students. Good point, thank you. Uh, so let's go on to number three. This one is just distributing the answer key. And so we saw in the first one that we gave it to one student, but in this technique, we're going to give answer keys either to every student if you have a small class, or maybe to a, a leader in a group of students. So um, as students check in groups, the teacher walks around to listen in um, and address any questions. One option or modification for this activity is that you can post copies of the key around the room up on the walls so students have to get up to check their answer. This could be energizing for students and you also don't need as many copies. Um, and then this is a really important part. After students are done checking, you can ask them questions like, uh, why, tell us about a question that you maybe had incorrect and why you changed it. How did you know? So this question we reflect on um, how students adjusted their responses. Hmm. And so we can look at some benefits of this. This can be faster than checking all the answers in IRF mode by going through each question one by one by one. Um, as we talked about earlier, how important it is to build student autonomy. This gives students the responsibility for monitoring their learning. And then if we do that last step of saying, hey, tell us about an answer you've got wrong and now you changed it and you know why it's right, um, this really promotes this kind of growth mindset. We teach students that we don't expect them to have every answer correct on the first try, but rather that we're expecting them to have some mistakes, but to learn from them. Um, yeah. And so uh, help me understand here, why give the answers to the to the, the questions? Aren't, it's a, is this like cheating? Ah, well, of course, we need to make sure that students did the homework in the first place. So uh -huh. they've already done the work. And we're just speeding up the process of rather than okay, number one is this, number two is this, how about number three? We let students set the pace of their own checking. So someone who is struggling can really take time and go at their own pace. Someone who is quick can confirm quickly that they know the right answers. Um, mm -hmm. So it can speed up the class quite a bit. Well, so Angela Romay says the disadvantage is that some of them could maybe copy the exercises after they see the answer key. So... Uh, what she suggests, like uh, stamping it after you look really quickly mm. before they exchange it. Yeah, um, I think that or, could work. Or even just if you, as you hand out the answer key before you hand it over, you know, take a look around the group, 
down at the student's work and just, you know, check it off if they've done their homework. So mm -hmm. that's what you're saying. And Yesenia Bonilla says, and she's, this is the, there's a trend here. She loves to have the move around the class and it also makes them more independent. Yes. And that is, that's what we're trying to do, right? So, mm -hmm. great, thank you. Okay, let's look at the fourth activity for checking answers. This one's a favorite of mine. Um, it's mini whiteboards. So the teacher or a student calls out, you know, okay, what's the answer to number one? Then students write their answer on a small whiteboard. And it doesn't have to be a very fancy official whiteboard. Um, they do sell those in stores, but the one you see here on the screen is just a screen, a sheet protector for a binder with a blank piece of paper inside of it. So it's students- like a sheet of, One of those sheets of plastic that you can put paper inside. And then what you just write on it with a um, dry erase marker? Yep, and even just a tissue can erase it. So it's, it's very simple. And also, you, if, even if you don't have access to these, you could make um, reusable cards that students keep at their desk. So like a small post-it that has, you know, true or false listed on it, or mm -hmm. a set for A, B, C, D for multiple choice. So then- so um, they, answer, they answer the questions with their paper. Yep, so they just right. hold it up. And then the teacher can look around and see, you know, how everyone was doing. And then the yeah. teacher can hold up the answer. And um, the teacher may choose before showing the answer to ask someone to say, you know, why did you pick this one? So there's an opportunity to see how students are doing, as well as to elicit some of those explanations behind mm -hmm. their choices. Um, and this is great because this, this is basically IRF, right? I mean except it's a little bit different. Everybody gets to answer at the same time and it's a kind of a mix up to make it more interesting, yeah? Exactly, and so um, we'll look at some of the benefits, but I think a big one is this is different from IRF because even, you know, sometimes we'll ask the entire class, so what's number three? And everyone kind of yells B and a couple students are like D and a couple students don't answer. So, um, at this way, everyone's accountable and we can glance around the room and see about how many students have something correct or incorrect. So that's mm -hmm. one of the benefits. And just a couple more are that um, this helps students focus because they all have to answer. They can't get lost in the crowd. And everyone just likes the tactile component using markers, choosing the color of the marker. I always do this for teacher training and I Actually, I'm traveling today and they are, I, my little sheet protector whiteboards are packed in my bag because everyone mm -hmm. loves it. Well, I'm sure you remember that this was probably the most popular activity from the morning session for good reason. And it reminds me that uh, during our Movement in the Classroom event at TESOL this year, Kevin McCoy, he uh, shared how students can stand up and use cards just like this. And it's a simple way just to get students out of their desks. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that we have to change everything that we're doing. We just need to change one thing and it becomes uh, uh, beneficial in an entirely new way. Exactly. And we also pointed out um, that this doesn't have to be for checking answers only. This is also a nice tool if you are sharing responses that are kind of a short phrase. So students could write a sentence and you know, provided they're close enough to the teacher, so it's not an eye exam, then the teacher can read a lot of responses in a short amount of time rather than calling on every student. So this is this is definitely a favorite of mine and it was also popular with a lot of our participants. Well a lot of a lot of people watching really like it too. Michael from Georgia, Yusuf Khan, um, Angela Romay, Monica Flores Rojas, they all absolutely love the idea of creating mini whiteboards or little answer post-its. Great, and so if you like this activity, but want to do it in a higher tech way, then that will take us to our fifth um, technique. So Kahoot is a nice tool for anyone who wants some technology in class. It allows teachers to create quizzes or surveys online on a website. So this does require that the teacher have a computer and a projector. 
and for some of the students to have mobile phones. And again, if this isn't a reality for you or a possibility in your classroom, stick with the mini whiteboards and you're mm -hmm. fine. Um, but if you're excited to use some new technology, then this could be of interest to you. So we don't have time for a full demo, but it's fairly easy to use. And we'll also provide instructions on um, how to design a Kahoot. So they're in the chat window now. Um, so let's look at a very simplified overview of how this works. And it does work internationally. My colleague in Japan is a huge fan and uses it in her classes all the time. Um, so the teacher creates a Kahoot before class. And this means writing the question, the answer choices, and marking which one's correct. Then during class, students log in via a mobile phone, either as an individuals or in a small team. So you can see they go to a website on their phone and enter a, a password, a pin code. Then they answer the questions in a game show format. And um, it also has some music that you can play that people, that students tend to like. And then as students press the answer on their phone, the results are displayed live. Mm. So, um, so they yeah. have to have a computer in the classroom with a projector. Mm -hmm. And the students need to have mobile devices and everyone has to have access to the internet. Exactly. Right? And so it gets, is ahead of time and the students answer on their phones. Right. And it's, um, there's a timer, so you can allot a timer. So that really keeps students focused. They don't have the chance to start opening other apps on their phone. Um, and again, mm -hmm. if, if this doesn't work, if you don't have all those resources, just stick with the mini whiteboards and you're good to go. Well, we have some teachers actually say that they use Kahoot and Humaira Jamshid uh, just got the idea to use Kahoot in uh, her e-learning class. Oh, yes, that's such a good, that's a great use for it. And I just saw one of their newest features is you can assign a Kahoot as homework. So that's another one you can look at. Uh, Carlos Reyes says it takes a long time to prepare them. Um, and finding po possible tricky answers. I mean, we there's a reason why a lot of us don't like to write multiple choice questions because they're extremely difficult. But he should know that there are pre-built cahoots on the website that can be adapted um, or used freely. That's true. And you can also just adapt um, exercises from the textbook and turn them into a cahoot as well. Mm. So there's a lot of ways to speed it up, but there's a bit of a learning curve, it's true. Um, so let's recap this section. And so for the Kahoot, we get that visual data. Um, the competition can be a little bit energizing for students. And um, it uses students' mobile phones for good instead of for distractions. So um, if this is a topic that's important to you and of interest, there's another session of AE Live on July 11th that's about using mobile devices in the classroom. Um, so let's kind of summarize and um, so this is our five, these are our five techniques for checking answers. Which ones, this is a question for our audience, which ones are you most excited to try and why? Hmm. Well, you know, if you were to ask me. Yes. I would say that I'm interested to try student as teacher. Um, because, you know, I have, what? when I was in the classroom, I had uh, challenges with students that would always finish early. And uh, I, instead of like writing something special just for them, maybe I can give them the student as teacher option. I like that one a lot for early finishers myself. And then often that student can describe something to their classmate in a, or explain it in a way that you never thought of. So mm -hmm. that's a really use, a useful one. Uh, as I've mentioned, the white mini whiteboards is one of my personal favorites. Let's see, Hanan Wire likes Kahoot. Um, and mini whiteboards uh, are getting a lot of attention right. Kahoot as well. I think that we're going to see some of these happening in classrooms around the world starting tomorrow. Stephanie, what do you think? Oh, I sure hope so. And I hope that we get to see some pictures if we can. Well, so let me say here, um, as we hear your answers to the discussion question as they come in, 
I just wanted to say hi and welcome to those of you who are just joining us now. We're glad that you're here. We are live right now for our second session of American English Live Series 2 today. We're talking with Stephanie Owens, English language specialist, and she's uh, sharing with us dynamic ways to check answers and share responses in the English language classroom. We've talked about some fun ways to check answers, and I think we're not going to talk about new ways to share responses. Is that right, Stephanie? That's right. Thank you for the perfect transition. So mm, that's what we're going to move into. Five more activities, and this one is for sharing responses. So just to remind everyone what we mean by that, um, sharing responses is open answers to open-ended questions where there's not something that's necessarily correct or incorrect or um, kind of a summary of group work. So, of course, in order to share responses, we need to have a classroom where students have the opportunity for open-ended practice and discussions. Um, and when we do have those opportunities and students are really engaged, um, asking that kind of IRF model of, so what did your group talk about doesn't give our students enough credit because they do, that platform, it got, doesn't give them enough time to really explain all of the things they talked about. Um, and then if the answers are only for us as teachers, we can just easily walk around and listen to what students are saying in their groups. But if we want the whole class to have an insight to another group's ideas or discussion, then we can think of some interactive ways to facilitate sharing responses. So let's look at the first of our five activities. This one is called ambassadors. And this is much the most effective when you have discussions that require a lot of conversation, um, things like making a choice and defending it analyzing a situation, discussing pros and cons. So after students have a discussion like that, then one group member is the ambassador and they visit another group to summarize the discussion. And uh, to get more mileage out of this, you can tell all of the students listening um, that maybe they need to fill out a worksheet or answer a certain question based on the ambassador's report. So mm. let's look at a particular activity that could work well with this. Um, so this I'm envisioning for a more advanced level class. So in small groups, students discuss the 10 things they would bring with them to a deserted island. They need to talk about what they would bring, how each item would help them, and how they could increase their chance of survival by combining items and using them together. So again, that's a pretty um, extensive conversation. There's a lot to discuss and even like argue a little bit about. So after students make their list of 10, as the teacher, I would say, um, give these instructions that, so one, an ambassador will visit your group to share what their group discussed. You will be able to choose one item from their list to add to yours. So mm. listen carefully to help you decide um, and this is what it looks like. And so a benefit of this setup is that every student will have the chance to be an ambassador. So in round one, um, we're going to assign, you know, a student number one from each group. So we see there are four groups of three students. So each, they, each number one is an ambassador. Exactly. So then they will all move um, in this round kind of clockwise mm -hmm. to visit the next group and give their summary. So it'll look like this once they rotate. Mm -hmm. And then they're giving their summary. Their group members are listening and choosing their one item they get to keep. And then the ambassador returns to their group. And so at this point, the groups have only heard from one other group but we are all having interesting discussions, so we can have round two. And now we have a new student who's an ambassador, and so that their uh, students or the other groups aren't hearing the same information, the ambassador goes to a different group. So in this case, they're kind of switching, they're going across diagonally, and this definitely requires some clear organization from the teacher. Um, and once again, the student summarizes. So it's the same information and the same topic, but this time for a different group or from a different group. And then once again, they get to pick a new item 
um, add that to their list, and the ambassador returns to their group. So this means that everyone in each group gets the chance to be an ambassador mm -hmm. to another group, and every group has an ambassador visit them from every other group. Yes, so, and then that's what happens in round three, since we have three students per group. So this is our final ambassador visit, and instead of going clockwise or across, this time they go counterclockwise to another group. Um, mm. And so- Actually, I have a question, what do you do? This is from uh, Mayui Coelho. What do you do when you have that one really clever student that wants to do everything by himself in the group, the others don't put any effort? Hmm. Hopefully, after a couple rounds of this, the students who have been slacking off or like, you know, not participating mm -hmm. realize they're going to give a very disappointing summary because the other group who's awaiting this ambassador visit won't get the information that they need. So that's mm -hmm. why it's really important to have a clear task. Because mm -hmm. if, if I said, just tell the group what you said, hmm, there's not, there's, there's not as much at stake, but if the students need your information to finish something they need, then you're going to be a little more peer pressure. Like, why aren't you doing a good job? Tell mm -hmm. us more. I don't, we don't want any of these items. Tell it. So there's more peer pressure. And so you, you have a, all your students kind of helping you as the teacher, make sure that these types of students participate. I think that's I think that's great, and I can just add uh, very quickly. Christine Mary says, for something like this, even quieter students have a chance to be ambassadors. I think probably because they're talking in smaller groups, mm -hmm. right? Rather than you know answering a question in front of the entire class. Uh, Souza Ruiz likes this as a way to create authentic interaction. Um, Bartek uh, Bogunia says it keeps them moving and active, and we know how important that is. And one quick question from Juan Carlos Toro Block. Um, how much time should we expect an activity like this to take up? Uh, this one definitely takes a good amount of time. Um, I would probably give each ambassador close to five minutes, maybe three to five minutes. Depends on what the original discussion was. Um, but again, because there's so much talking and that authentic listening, um, to me, I, it's a good investment of the time. It's not something I want to rush through. And we're also asking the groups to really um, use that information to maybe modify their original ideas based on something new that they heard. And this is a huge skill for students to have, to have this like open-mindedness and flexibility, which is really important in this kind of global learning environment. So I think it's worth the time if you can have a good discussion first and a clear task for everyone to participate in. Yeah. Great. So let's go ahead to the second activity because I think our we all agreed on those benefits. Um, this one's called superlative summary. And so just to remind everyone, a superlative is includes words or phrases like the best, the silliest, the most unique. Um, so in this one, students complete group work, such as a discussion, and the teacher asks a superlative response question that requires students to kind of synthesize information. Um, and then in this case, there it is an IRF model, which we'll see, but you can also have students write their response and maybe collect them at the end of class. So let's see how this, what this might sound like in the classroom. Um, so our original activity is students talked about their favorite movies in small groups. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing this, uh, so John Mark, what's your favorite movie? Uh, Titanic. Oh, okay. Sam, how about you? So mm. instead of that, we can try this. John Mark, from your group, who had the most surprising favorite movie? Hmm. I'll say Lee. Her favorite movie is Fast and Furious. I don't think he, uh, I mean, she likes action movies. Ah, so you'll notice again, this is the IRF model. I'm asking a student and then they're responding. But the type of question I'm asking really changes the quality of the response. So you can see instead of one word, it's a whole phrase. The student had a chance to correct themselves. And now I also have a chance to maybe do some error correction here with the verb tenses in the response, if it's a good time for it. Um, so 
again, phrasing this type of question really makes the students work a little bit harder. So some benefits of this might be that students respond to what they hear from their group mates instead of just repeating something. Uh, it can have, has the opportunity to build rapport because we're hearing personal responses. Students have to pay attention to what their peers said during the discussion. And like we saw in that example, there's more opportunity for li richer language output. So like longer sentences, different grammar instead of one word responses. Right. So let's move on to the third activity. So this one is a gallery walk. And this is something that you can do in many, many ways um, in the classroom, not just for sharing responses, but we'll look at it for sharing responses here. So students complete work, um, like a response to a writing prompt, and then they hang up their work on the wall and all the students walk around, read and respond. Um, so let's take a look. Instead of this, so if the activity is that students wrote a paragraph about their favorite place to spend time, instead of this IRF model of, so Amit, what did you write about? And Amit says, Phoenix Mall. I say, oh, okay, I love Phoenix Mall. Deki, what about you? That's our classic IRF. So instead, we can do this. Um, so you... I'm going to have all the students hang up their paragraphs or their written responses on the wall. And I'm going to say, you all wrote about your favorite place. Imagine we have the afternoon free, no English class. I know it's very sad. We still have class. Uh, I want you to read your classmates' responses. If you want to spend our free afternoon at that place they wrote about, just write a star on the paper. So then students are walking around and kind of voting on some of those responses that they're reading. So as you can see, we're asking the students to respond to each other's work in a communicative way rather than evaluating or correcting kind of way. Um, and now students have this authentic audience. And that's really important for building community in the classroom. That's true. Um, we're getting some really great responses uh, stepping to this, uh, Yusuf Khan says, uh, use, he uses uh, the gallery walk a lot. And Jackie Violeta Flores says, wow, this is my favorite activity. And she used three exclamation points to say so. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. I like this one a lot too. Um, so let's look at some of the benefits that, um, of course, it gets students moving. We're sharing personal responses. There are, are these like authentic reactions. And um, the teacher can get a lot of information about student performance. And again, it mixes things up in the classroom. I'm glad you like it, Jackie. All right, I hope you guys like the fourth one too. So our fourth activity is just very simple. Um, it's called buttons. I don't mean buttons on your shirt, but rather just a token that students get. Um, so this is something I had to invent for my classes and my training groups because so many times I would walk around listening to discussions and I was like, oh, that, that was such a good idea. And then when we are all sharing and I was calling on students, I would say, oh, Bonnie, tell us about that great idea your group had. And Bonnie would be like, what? <laughs> Not just Bonnie, any class, they can't, re any student, they can't remember their great ideas. So with this, as you walk around and hear something good, you can give this little button to the student and say, I love this idea. Can you make a note and share it with the class? I will probably call on you in a little while. Um, so again, we have that IRF model, but the student knows what they're going to say and um, you're supporting them and you're not doing the summarizing as the teacher. The student gets a chance to summarize their own mm -hmm. ideas again. Um, so, um, one activity this might work in, so if you have students sharing study strategies for learning vocabulary, you hear a student say something that the majority of the class would benefit from, you give them a button, they write down their little note, and then you call on them. So the benefits here are that, um, you know, the student doesn't forget and the teacher ends up doing the work. And it's also a nice way to recognize students who are on track. Um, who are participating in a great way or just have good ideas. 
And um, uh, can do they get to keep the buttons? Do they have to give the buttons back? Can I think they could buttons? definitely keep them. And it's kind of a nice thing because it's like getting a gold star, this proof that, oh, I had a good idea and I got to share it. Um, so sure, it's up to you and how you'd like to use it in your classroom. They can be like digital badges. You know, you give out a button and then you get a, a digital badge for it. I don't know. I like it. Yeah, they could be stickers even, like the large size, so there's room for the student to write. There's a lot mm -hmm. you can do with it. Um, and our final activity is called Last One Standing. So in this, a teacher asks a question, students write three responses, and everyone stands up. And then as students start sharing, if on my paper on the student, I have an idea that was shared, I put a check. And every time, and once all three of my ideas are checked off, I sit down and then we'll have one student sta left standing, maybe with an original idea or a different take on something. Hmm. So let's see what that looks like. So we can use this to reflect on some new grammar, like write three things you need to remember when using the present perfect versus the simple past. Um, so then the students write their notes there are three ideas here. And they're then, doing this individually at their desk. They're answering. Exactly. Okay. And so then everyone stands up and the teacher will call on someone. And so a student says, um, we need to remember to use the simple pass if you know exactly when something happened and that it's finished. And now this, uh, if I'm the student, I'm looking at a paper and I see that my number two is saying the same thing, maybe different words, but it's about the same. So I'm putting a check next to that response. And once all three check, all three of mm. my ideas are checked off, I can sit down. Mm -hmm. I like it. Great. And there are a few ways you can use that, um, like for concept checks, for just sharing fun ideas, for brainstorming. Um, and the benefits here are that all the voices are heard, even if they're not spoken, students are acknowledging their own ideas by checking them and it can encourage creative thinking and it helps students hear and respond to paraphrasing, which is such a key skill as well. And it's really can be tough to teach. So those are our five activities for sharing responses. And so let's just look at them all listed together again. And again, which sharing responses technique are you most excited to try and why? Hmm. You want to hear mine? I, of course I do. I always do. Well, and we also, we want to hear what our participants have to say, what their favorite way to share responses is. Um, let's see. I'm excited to try using buttons in the classroom because I think there's a lot of potential there for using the buttons for a variety of reasons. Students can collect them, students can decorate them, they can maybe attach them to their name tent if they have one, that kind of thing. I, like I wonder that. what our people in the audience um, have to say about ways to share responses. Um, what about you, Stephanie? What's your favorite? Um, I like ambassadors a lot. It can be tough to organize. So I also like superlative summary. I use that in a class. It was a little bit different. Students were giving presentations on um, quotes, like a kind of a proverb or a quote that was inspiring. And as everyone listened, the question they had to answer, it's not quite a superlatives, was if you had to get a tattoo of one of the quotes today, what yes. would it be? Wow. I know it was very serious. They really had to listen. And of course, if you're, um, if in your context, tattoos are taboo and that's not something appropriate for you have young students, you might change it to like, what would you put on a billboard? What would we paint on our wall as a big poster? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can really, you can tone it down. You don't have to be as drastic as a tattoo. <laughs> sure. I, I hear you. You know, we're hearing from our audience, they love the superlative summary, they love the gallery walk, they love buttons. Um, and this reminds me of a question that we had earlier that we get a lot that we saved for the end um, because um, in particular with ambassadors, what do you do if you have like large classes? 
Hmm. I think the biggest key there is planning ahead, kind of. So we saw that um, it looked like a classroom of 12 students, so three groups of four. So I might kind of subdivide my class into those sm like different groups. Um, that one's definitely a challenge. It's, but I think again, planning ahead, making it very clear of who's going to be in what group, um, being willing to kind of tell the class, hey, we're trying something to new. I need you to listen hard so we're all in the right place. I think yeah. you can do it. So uh, kind you of know, I, also, I also think that um, you, if the large class, it's probably okay if not everybody gets to be an ambassador because even then, yes. everybody does still get to be a part of the discussion no matter what. That's true. So in that case, if not everyone's the ambassador, maybe the teacher assigns the ambassador and really makes sure that they pick the ones, uh, the students who are more hesitant to share to really make sure they have a chance to mm -hmm. participate. So maybe that's a good idea. Thank you. That was, an, that was an inspiring question. Agreed. Well, I hate to say this, Stephanie, but our time is up. Do you have any final yeah. words for our viewers? Just a very big thank you. I loved hearing all of your ideas and your excitement. I hope that this inspires you to try out some of the techniques and even invent your own. So I loved hearing from you. Thank you so much. And thanks to the American English Live team for all the support that you provide to make these happen. Thanks, everyone. Super. We're so glad that you were here. I know I learned a lot, um, which means I'm pretty sure that our audience learned a lot too, although they're pretty experienced and pretty savvy. Um, well, we really appreciate that engaging session that you just gave. 